God's word, you are present, you are ready, you are expectant, the Lord is also ready and willing to bless you. Today, I want to talk about the tragedy of lost priorities. Tragedy of lost priorities. Why tragedy? Now you're wondering, now why is she telling us about tragedy? Why is it a tragedy? Project for us, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12 in message version. Shall we read together? It's on, your, on our screens. Let's go. I read like you believe it. These are all warning markers, danger. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You are not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. Paul reminds us that you are never too high to fall down. Therefore, there are many verses in the Bible which have been put down to be examples for us so that we don't have to fall into the same trap. When you are warned, when you see danger, you are warned. You, are, you don't have to fall because somebody else fell. One is enough. You don't have to be the second one. Receiving Jesus Christ is one, is the best decision any person can make. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, in the book of Ephesians of Romans chapter 8 and verse 8 in NIV. Romans 5 verse 8 in NIV. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I praise God that today was the Holy Communion Sunday when we were reminding ourselves how Jesus died for our sins. And the Bible goes further that actually he died for us even when we were still sinners. And thank him for his grace. A time came and you said yes to his saving grace. And no wonder one singer said, oh happy day when I made that decision, when I made the choice. Because when you make that great decision and embrace the grace of God, you are turned from a sinner to a son. A sinner, a slave to a son. And no wonder another singer said, I'm no longer a slave to sin. You are moved from darkness to light. Your name is written in the Lamb's good book of life. And you are made to sit on the heavenly places with Jesus Christ. So there are very many benefits once the, the Holy Spirit reveals, makes that revelation, and we embrace the grace of God. There are so many benefits that, ca that come along with that decision of receiving Jesus Christ. Not because you're qualified, but because God is good. Actually, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and maybe you can project it for us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it, can we read it together? For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So we never deserve the grace of God. Imagine God just looked at you, he had mercy on you, he opened up your eyes, and you are able, you are a foreigner, you became a citizen. 
You were very far, you came so close. There are many benefits that come along with, with receiving Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1:13 and 14. The benefits of receiving Jesus as our Savior, the grace of God. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Can we read together? And you also were included in Christ. When you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you are marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. Verse 14. Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his kingdom. Yani, he took you from nowhere. He came and he put a deposit of the Holy Spirit in you. He put a seal and he said, marked for eternity. It is such a blessing to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It is by grace that we enter the kingdom. However, much as there are so many benefits, it is not automatic. You have to continue walking under the marked boundaries of the grace of God. Otherwise, you can move from up there up to down there. Depending on how you will behave from the time you said yes to Jesus and the time we call you late. And we lay your body to rest. And this one brings to us why I decided to, to share this morning very quickly about the tragedy of lost priorities. And the character I want us to look at in the next few minutes is King Saul. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 9, maybe you can project it for us. And we will read for we together very quickly, and then I'll tell you a few things. We will be done. This is a story of King Saul. Are you ready to read? We are ready. Okay, let's go. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of A. Hey. Hatu umekibia sana rudi hatujamaliza hiyo ingine verse 1 The son of Zera the son of Bekorath the son of Athia of Benjamin verse 2 He had a son named Saul an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites a head taller than any of the others I want you to mark that verse 3 now the donkeys belonging to Saul, father Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go look for the donkeys. Verse 4. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Sharisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Sharim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. Verse 5. When they reached the district of Zub, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. Hold it there. You realize Kish was well up. He was well up in the society then. And his son, he was handsome, impressive, a shoulder higher than his peers. So they were... They had a status in the society. Their social status was good. However, they are very busy dealing with the donkeys. And let me tell you, before you meet Jesus Christ, some of us were busy looking for the donkeys. And unfortunately, we never found them. And actually, you decided to go to church because you thought the pastor can pray for you and you find the donkeys. Praise God, you'd never found the donkeys, but you found the Son of God who changed your story like Saul's story is about to change. Let's move on and we see how his story changed. Can we continue? We want to continue reading. 
But the servant replied, look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Saul said to his servant, if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered him again, look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, come let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be Good, Saul said to his servant, come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming up to draw water and they asked them, is the seer here? Yes, they answered, he is ahead of you, hurry now. He has just come to our town today for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Go up now, you should find him up this time. Just hold it there. This is Saul and his servant. Remember their business is looking for the donkeys. And they have gotten guidance. They have been told where to get the man of God. And the, lady, the girls are very generous with the information. They are telling them, hurry up. Because he will be able to see you before they go to eat. Those who are invited. Remember Saul and his servant, they, don't, they are not invited. Okay? Shall we continue? Today we will do a wrong reading. We refresh our memories. Okay. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the heart of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people for their cry has reached me. Hold it there. Saul is not aware because God has already gone ahead of him. And God has already revealed this one to the prophet. And he has told you tomorrow a time like this one. I'll send you a man from Benjamin and you will anoint him. I pray that you are that one, that the Lord has already gone ahead of you and your blessing is awaiting there. Saul thought he's looking for the down case. Samuel was waiting for somebody to anoint, to become king. Let's continue with our story. When Samuel caught up sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Verse 18. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? This is how naive Saul was. He's talking to the man he is looking at for. Sawa, sawa. Let's continue. Samuel replied, Go up ahead of me to the high place. For today you are to eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your father's family? Saul answered, but am I not a Benjaminite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? Hold it. And this is what happened the day you received the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember I told you about the benefits of embracing the grace of God. You all of a sudden, after a sinner's prayer, you are told you have moved from death to life. 
from darkness to light. You are no longer a slave, you are a son. You already have a godly inheritance. From a foreigner to a citizen, an ambassador of Jesus Christ, the blessings are just overwhelming. And I can see Saul was saying, I am from the smallest tribe, and you are telling me great things. I am just imagining how excited and how surprised Saul was. Can we continue with the story? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall and seated them at the head of those who are invited. Imagine, who would have said that he can be invited? No wonder the Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2 that he leaves the poor from the ashes and he makes them to feast with the kings. Saul is being elevated and he told this was for the invited. He didn't know he had an invitation. Samuel said to the cook, this is very nice, bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the leg, I think leg was the good one, eh? the favorite, tamoturogo. So the cook took up the leg with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been kept for you. It, because it was set aside for you for this occasion. From the time I said, I have invited guests and Saul dined with Samuel that day. You see the elevation of God. The elevation of the grace of God. After they came down from the high place to town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I'll send you on your way. When he said, Together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Verse 28. As they were, let's read, see, yes, then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him saying, has not the Lord anointed you leader over his inheritance? That, it was a wrong leading, maybe the longest some of you have read this week, so now that one has covered for the last week. But we needed to lead so that we may be able to get the background of the story. And this is now the call. It is at this point that now Saul has been anointed. And after the anointing, he was given the instructions. Because of time, we will not read. You can go and finish the story. He was told what will happen. And it all came to pass. He was told, among the things he was, uh, he was told is that he will meet a group of prophets and he will prophesy like one of them and it came to pass when he met the prophets he found himself also prophesying and the bible says it became a saying even Saul son of Kish is prophesying wasn't it said of you when you said you got saved and you used to stand out with people who are believers and people would ask even so and so these days he is a preacher it was said it is all in the Bible. Remember it was written for us as examples. Saul has been anointed. Saul has been elevated. But he was given instructions. And because we, want to, we won't read the story, I want to fast forward the story. Among the instructions he was given, he was told to go and wait for Samuel the prophet for seven days. And Samuel would come over and he would give the sacrifice. Remember now we are at the top. See, Samuel has been surprised by God. And he has been told he was being waited for and he was not aware. And he was given a choice piece of meat, the egg. And it was brought and he ate with among the chosen few. Now he is told to go back and wait for seven days. Remember I told you my topic was tragedy of lost priorities. From that point on, Saul started losing it. 
And this is how he lost it. When he was, the Bible says, if you can read in chapter 15, which we will not read, one, Saul has been told he has been anointed to become a kingdom builder. To read God's people. He will lead them. He will be their king. A kingdom builder. But when he went there, the Bible says that the Philistines started fighting the Israelites. The seventh day came when Samuel was supposed to come. And Samuel delayed. And when he delayed, the Bible says the warriors started running away. And Saul discovered even his warriors are living alone and he panicked. When he panicked, he forgot the instructions. The instructions were to wait until Samuel comes to burn the sacrifice. Burner as if he were. This is what the Bible says. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done, Saul? What have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that they did not come with, you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now, your kingdom shall not continue. Remember, a few verses earlier, he has been anointed to be king. He has refused or failed to follow the instructions. He has panicked. He has become impatient to wait for the prophet. And he has decided what the prophet can do, I can also do. And I am here to warn you. You want to maintain the grace of God, just operate within your anointing. Paul had been anointed to be a king, not a prophet. But he thought now that he was justifying. I saw people running, walking away from me. The enemy was coming. Does it sound familiar that you found yourself in a fix and you could not wait on God and you decided to compromise? Let me tell you, when Saul started losing his priorities and the priority was to obey God, to obey the prophets, when he started drifting down, the dangers, the tragedy of when you start deciding what to obey and what not to obey. That is the first time. And the prophet really rebuked him. The prophet said, you have acted foolishly. Let me tell you, when the Bible calls you foolish, I wish there was a more kinder word. Eh? He has just been anointed. But now he has started losing it. The very prophet who anointed him is now telling him you have acted foolishly. Saul didn't learn from that. Now we have started the downward trend. And that's why I'm saying the tragedy of lost priorities. That is the first one. First Samuel 15, 12 to 15. The second one is in First Samuel 15. The one I said earlier is 1 Samuel 13, 5 to 13. Now we are in the second, the second incident where Saul started drifting down. Chapter 15, 12 to 15. Hydra projected for us. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor 
and has turned and gone on down to Gigel. Hold it. He was anointed the other day. Now he has already erected a monument on his own honor. The Lord blesses you and the blessings start taking you farther and farther from the same God who has given you the blessings. Let's continue the next verse. Verse 13. When Samuel reached him, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Self-justification. But Samuel said, What then is this breathing of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Verse 15. Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest. The instructions were to destroy everything. Now he acts like he has obeyed 100%. Then the prophet says, and what is that noise I'm hearing? Now he passes on the brim to his soldiers. He was not part of it. Who was the leader? Who was the king? Who had been given the instructions? He says the soldiers are the ones who did that. Selective obedience. Next time you find yourself deciding what to obey and what to obey, you better know you are on a downward tread. And there is a tragedy ahead. And it is after that, that incident, and we like quoting it many times, that he was rebuked and told, to obey is better than sacrifice. And I'm here to remind the believers listening to me, the believers who have received the grace of God free of charge, I am here to remind you that to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than to serve God. To obey... God is more interested with your obedience than in your service. That is the second incident that God was very disappointed. Actually, if you continue with the story, Samuel, was, Samuel received the message from God that God regretted why he made Saul the king. When you start deciding what to obey, when you start uh, bowing before the blessings God has given you, God is so grieved, God is so disappointed, and he wonders. I pray that you, God, will not regret having saved you because of the way you are disobedient. If you continue with that story, when Saul was rebuked, instead of being sorry, he went ahead. And he, in 1 Samuel 15, 27, maybe you can project it for us. The Bible says that God raised sorrow brings about repentance. 1 Samuel 15, 27. This is after that confrontation and Samuel has just rebuked Saul. Let's read together. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and he, it tore. Verse 28. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. Verse 29. He who, glory of Israel, does not try or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Verse 30. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Instead of pursuing because he should be remorseful of his act, he's busy asking the prophet to honor him in front of the elders. And as if that was not enough, the next thing that Saul did. He's still on the downward thread. Remember he entered through grace. And we were so very excited. The way the Lord surprised him. There was even a party prepared. With him in mind and he was not aware. 
But now, because of obeying small selective obedience, being impatient, his, his star is no longer rising. It is coming down. And we all know, from that point on, after he was told that God has identified another one better than him who was David, and we know the story that David was anointed. From that point on, because women celebrated David and they sang a song that Saul has laid thousands, but David has laid tens of thousands. That in itself killed Saul's ego. And from that point on, he forgot he was a kingdom builder. He started chasing David to kill him. Because he is being praised more than him and he's the king. Instead of celebrating that David has been used of God to deliver Israelites from the Philistines. That one too didn't make God happy. And as I wind up, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 31. He was anointed in chapter 9. Chapter 13, he made his one major brother. When he could not, he didn't have the grace to wait for the prophet to come and give the sacrifice. Verse 15, he decides what to kill and what not to kill. From chapter 17, 18, and all those chapters after that, he was very busy chasing David. Now, chapter 31. In the Bible I was using, the heading of that chapter, it says, the death of Saul. And very quickly, I want to bring you to how Saul died. Because it was actually a tragedy. The Bible says that Saul and his team and his warriors were in the battle. And by mistake, a stray arrow critically injured Saul. And when Saul discovered that he has been wounded critically, he was very proud. He turned back to his armor bearer and said, maybe you can read, start verse 3, let's read, let's refresh our memories. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Verse 4. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or this uncircumcised pharaohs will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. In other words, Saul committed suicide. From a king, you see the, the dangers? You see how he's going down? Now he has killed himself. As if that is not enough, let's continue. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. Hold it. What we didn't read is before Saul dying, his sons have also been killed during the battle. It becomes a, tra a tragedy. It is a proper disaster. The finishing was disgraceful for King Saul. The armor bearer has died. Verse 6. Saul Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together the same day. It's not over. Let's continue. When the Israelites around the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israel army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled and the Philistines came and occupied them. To fast forward the story, Saul is dead. After that, some people passed by and discovered, the Bible says that Saul had had disguised himself and they discovered it is the king who died so the enemies came and cut his head and they went with the head and took it to the temple of their gods you see how disgraceful it was and you think that was enough they came and took his body and then went and hanged it on the wall
like when, he was, when the people heard that Saul's body has been hanged on the wall. And we all know to be hanged on the cross, it was a tragedy those times. That's why Jesus, it was actually a curse. That's why the Bible says that Jesus became a curse by hanging on the cross. And now Saul is not hanged on the cross, but hanged on the wall. A headless body hanged on the wall. I hope you are marking how he has started coming down. That was not the end. When they discovered that his headless body is hanging on the wall, some people decided to come for the body and they went and burnt it. We are talking of, um, what do they call it? Being burned? Eh? The first cremation. A king, his burial was cremation. Very sad, an abomination in Israel. It all started when he started changing goalposts. The tragedy of lost priorities. So lost their priority. The Lord had already declared that he is being anointed to become the king of Israel. But he started changing it. I can do this and not do this. Then I blame these people. It is my friend who made me do this. Am I talking to somebody this morning that one day you embrace the grace of God, but you have gotten to an extent that these days you can virtually do anything. You don't know your boundaries. You can actually commit any sin and the following day you are on the altar. Remember where we started. And maybe you can project it for us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, in the message version. That these stories are in the Bible. That you may know you are not an exempt. Can we read together? These are all warning markers. Danger. It is in capital. In our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Verse 12. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You are not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about your self-confidence. It is useless. Cultivate God confidence. And what is God's confidence? It is honoring God with yourself and all that you have and all that you will have. You remember it is God who has given you. The grace was free but you have to operate within the mandate of the grace of God for you to remain and for your star to continue shining brighter. We realize that when Saul was anointed, he came from a donkey seeker and he rose to a king. But because of disobedience, his star started becoming dimmer and dimmer, and it led to a tragic death. From a king, you are killed by a stray bullet, maybe what you would call a stray bullet today. You are beheaded, your body is hung on the wall, then it is cremated. We have just been told these stories are in the Bible to be an example for us that you are not exempt. All these things, they are for us and they can be and we can. Your daily walk will determine how you finish your walk of faith. I pray that it will not be said from grace to disgrace. Because in the case of the story of Saul, we can say he entered through grace, but it is a disgraceful death. It is a death none of us would like to choose to be. How did he end there? You can also end there. But the good news this morning, you don't have to end there. But this one will be determined by your commitment on daily basis to follow the Lord, to honor the Lord, to respect the Lord. When he blesses you, you will not build a monument to worship yourself. You will embrace the blessing 
and give the glory to the blesser. Shall we arise? With every eye closed, and as we meditate on the word and the story we have just read, and the word we have read that this one, we are also not exempt. The devil is no respecter of persons. He can embarrass you. I want you to reflect on your life. And find out whether there are some wrong values which you have started embracing. Because wrong values will take you where you would never have thought you can go. I don't think that Saul ever thought he could die such a disgraceful death. Remember, the Bible says that God is not mocked. Your pastor, your leader may not know what you do in darkness. They may not know where you are compromising, but God knows. And because God is no respecter of persons, I want to ask this question because we are in the house of God. Are you listening to me this morning? And you can say this, I know I have started drifting and I'm making a long turn. And I said the good news is, as far as long as you are listening to me and you are ready to make your ways, you don't have to end up there. There is room of asking the Lord to bring you back to the path because you want to finish strong. So are you there? And you would want me to pray for you because you want to go come back and embrace the boundaries of the grace of God. If you are there and you want me to pray for you, I want you to lift up your hand. You are there and you want God to remember you because you know what you are doing, you are taking the wrong path. Are you there? Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. The Lord is seeing those hands. And the good thing with God, he does not condemn us. He convicts us so that we may mend our ways. So are you there? Don't fear men. Men will do you nothing. But God can do everything. So if you want to lift up your hand the last time, just lift up your hand and I want to include you in this prayer. Thank you for those hands. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for every hand that is lifted up. My brothers and my sisters are telling you that as they led and listened to your word this morning, they saw where they are erring and they are coming back that you may forgive them, embrace them and help them to come back to the right path. I am praying for them that God of mercy, you'll give them another chance. You'll give them the grace to turn around from sin and say no to sin and say yes to righteousness because you are a holy God and without holiness, no man, no woman will see you. I now pray for each one of them that God, you remember them. And even after this, you keep on reminding them, thank you that you have put in us the seal of your Holy Spirit as a guarantee, as a teacher, as a counselor and as a helper. May your Holy Spirit continue guiding them to say not to sin because you are not moved. I bless them today and I declare they are forgiven because they have willingly come back and said sorry to you. Bless them we pray in Jesus name.